everyone. Today we're going to talk about Macbeth, Act 2. When we discussed Act 1, we focused on how language affects thinking, and especially how language affects thinking about the future, and also whether language can express reality. These ideas are further explored in Act 2. We see just how powerfully words can affect how someone thinks in Act 2, Scene 1. Banquo is up late at night, and he says to himself, a heavy summons lies like lead upon me, and yet I would not sleep. Merciful powers restrain in me the cursed thoughts that nature gives way to in repose. Banquo wants to sleep. A heavy summons to sleep lies upon him. But he can't sleep because he has cursed thoughts that are troubling his dreams. Macbeth, walking around the castle, then runs into Banquo. And Banquo tells Macbeth, I dreamt last night of the weird sisters. Remember, the witches prophesied that Macbeth would become the king of Scotland, but they also prophesied that Banquo's sons or grandsons or great-grandsons would eventually become kings themselves. And these words of the witches have so deeply affected Banquo that he's now dreaming about them. Their words have infected or altered his unconscious mind. He seems to be becoming obsessed with the prophecies of the witches as well. Now, Macbeth replies to Banquo, I think not of them. But we know this is a lie. He and his wife are planning to kill Duncan and frame his two guards for the murder in a few hours. But more than that, after Banquo leaves Macbeth alone, something strange happens. Macbeth begins to hallucinate. He sees a bloody dagger floating in front of him. Is this a dagger which I see before me? The handle toward my hand. Come, let me clutch thee. I have thee not and yet I see thee still. Art thou not, fatal vision, sensible to feeling as to sight? A dagger seems to be beckoning Macbeth, to be ordering him or tempting him to commit the murder he's been thinking about. Now, nothing in Macbeth's life has really changed yet. After defeating Macdonwald in battle, he's been made Thane of Cawdor, which fulfilled one of the witch's predictions. But that isn't such a big deal, and it could have been a coincidence. It certainly isn't clear evidence that the witches should be trusted. Yet simply because of the words the witches have spoken, Banquo, and especially Macbeth, have changed. They're having strange dreams and visions, and Macbeth is thinking about doing something horrific. Is this realistic? Are words really this powerful? Think about it. Let's say you hear a rumor about a celebrity that you've always admired or about one of your friends, maybe, that they've done something terrible. You haven't seen them do anything, they don't seem any different to you, you've only heard a rumor. All of a sudden, though, your perception of that person might change dramatically. You might not quite trust them anymore, just because of the words you've heard. Or consider, especially now, when we're all in quarantine, and many of us are not leaving our homes frequently. A lot of what's going on in the world comes to us from news articles we read, or text messages or social media posts we get from our friends. A large part of our understanding of the world, of our sense of how reality works, of what's happening around us, comes to us not through our senses, but just through words. And Macbeth's sense of what's possible for him, of what he might be capable of, has fundamentally altered merely because of words he's heard. Macbeth himself seems to be aware of words' power. At the end of the soliloquy, in which he sees the dagger, he says, Words to the heat of deeds, too cold breath gives. He's worried that if he talks to himself about this murder too much, he won't do it. He'll talk himself out of it. And so, he stops talking. Now, the last video ended with the question, Can they do it? Can Macbeth and Lady Macbeth do what they're planning to do? Can they kill an old man in his sleep and frame two innocent people for the murder so they can rise to power? Are they cold enough, ruthless enough, brutal enough? In Act 2, Scene 2, we find out that Macbeth has, offstage, killed Duncan. He comes back to his wife, late at night, covered in Duncan's blood. But the answer as to whether Macbeth and Lady Macbeth are capable of murdering for the sake of power is not that simple. Right before Macbeth returns after killing Duncan, as Lady Macbeth waits for her husband, 
She thinks to herself, had he not resembled my father as he slept, I had done it. Lady Macbeth is admitting to herself that she does not have it in her to murder Duncan in his sleep. The old man looks too much like her father. After Macbeth returns covered in blood, she tells him, these deeds must not be thought after these ways, so it will make us mad. She's telling him, we can't think about the murder. If we do, we'll lose our minds. Now that the deed is done, she can't even think about it. Lady Macbeth seems incapable of murder. Now, Macbeth has committed the murder. He has stabbed Duncan in his bed, but he messes up. He comes back with the two daggers he used to kill Duncan, which he was supposed to lay on the two drunk guards to frame them. Lady Macbeth is furious because Macbeth has brought back evidence that they are guilty. And she says, why did you bring the daggers from the place? They must lie there. Go, carry them and smear the sleepy grooms with blood. And Macbeth replies, I'll go no more. I am afraid to think what I have done. Look on it again, I dare not. Macbeth can commit the murder, but he cannot do what he has to do to get away with it. It seems he won't let himself get away with it. It seems like his guilt paralyzes him. He seems to acknowledge and maybe even accept that he's going to be found out for this crime, thinking to himself, will all great Neptune's ocean wash this blood clean from my hand? No, this my hand will rather the multitudinous seas incarnadine, making the green one red. Macbeth thinks nothing not even the entire ocean could wash the blood of this murder off of his hand. There's so much blood on his hands, it would instead make the green ocean red. However, Lady Macbeth takes the daggers, goes to the sleeping guards, and smears the blood all over them. She can't commit the murder, but she can do what they need to do to get away with it. So, can they do it? Can Macbeth and Lady Macbeth kill Duncan to take his crown? It isn't quite clear. Neither of them quite does it. Neither of them can commit the murder and frame the innocent guards. Neither of them is quite ruthless enough. The murder for the crown has happened, but it wasn't completely committed by either one of them. The act happened somehow between them. But now they've done this thing that neither of them could do individually, and everything changes, as we see in Act 2, Scene 3. We discussed in the last video how reality is frequently too complex to be expressed by words like fair or foul or won or lost. Sometimes reality is so overwhelming, so shocking, that words can't capture any of it words don't work at all anymore. Everything changes so dramatically in Act 2, Scene 3, that words cannot express it. When the nobleman Macduff, arriving at Macbeth's castle the next morning, discovers Duncan's body, he tells everyone, Oh horror, horror, horror! Tongue nor heart cannot conceive nor name thee. And when people ask him to tell them what happened, he replies, do not bid me speak. The murder of Duncan is so horrifying and so unexpected, there are no words for it yet. Words can't capture the shock Macduff has experienced. We also see in this scene that when people speak, no one, neither the characters in the play nor those of us reading or watching the play, can be sure what they mean. When everyone in the castle is gathered together to discuss Duncan's murder, Macbeth says, Had I but died an hour before this chance, I had lived a blessed time. For from this instant there is nothing serious in mortality. All is but toys. Renown and grace is dead. The wine of life is drawn, and the mere lees is left this vault to brag of. It might sound like, after his guilty breakdown after the murder, Macbeth has now, the next morning, pulled himself together. It might sound like Macbeth is coolly and collectedly covering for himself. Like everyone else in the room, he's expressing grief at the murder of the king. He's playing innocent. 
But look at those words carefully. There is nothing serious in mortality. All is but toys. Renown and grace is dead. Macbeth might also be expressing how he really feels in this moment. Now that he's committed a horrific murder, life is meaningless to him. Lives, including his own, are nothing more than toys. Is Macbeth playing a role here? Or is he speaking honestly? Or is he doing both at once? It depends on the actor who plays the scene and also on how you read it. The scene ends with two other characters warning us that we can't trust words. King Duncan's two sons, Malcolm and Donalbane, are not convinced that the two guards killed their father. And Malcolm warns his brother that they can't trust anyone else in the castle. Let's not consort with them. To show an unfelt sorrow is an office which the false man does easy. Malcolm tells his brother, it's easy for someone to express grief when they actually feel quite differently. And one of these people who seems so upset about their father's death might be coming for them next. So Malcolm flees to England and Donald Bain to Ireland. And the two sons of the king gone and the king dead, the words of the witches have come true. And Macbeth is the king.